belated good wishes for the new year from all of us on A Plus Four. A new year we're opening up with a singer who seems to represent, for a growing number of young people, the mood of the 80s. He has no band, doesn't use synthesizers, and doesn't make videos. His songs are about inner cities and dole queues, and even about the bypass near his home in Barking. But we are going to begin with perhaps his best known song, New England, a contemporary love song, Billy Bragg. I was 21 years when I wrote this song I'm 22 now but I won't be for long People ask me when will I grow up to be a man But all the girls I loved at school are already pushing prams I loved you then as I love you still Though I put you on a pedestal, they put you on the pill I don't feel bad about letting you go Just feel sad about letting you know to change the world I'm not looking for New England I'm just looking for another girl I don't want to change the world I'm not looking for a New England I'm just looking for another girl I love the words you wrote to me but that was bloody yesterday I can't survive on what you send Every time you need a friend I saw two shooting stars last night I wished on them But they were only satellites It wrong to wish on Space hardware I wish, I wish, I wish you'd care I don't want to change the world I'm not looking for a New England I'm just looking for another girl I don't want to change the world I'm not looking for a New England I'm just looking for another girl Looking for another girl Looking for another girl Looking for another girl Now then, Billy Bragg, that was written at the tender age of 22, <coughs> yes, and you're indeed. sitting in front of me now at the ripe old age of 28. Only just. <laughs> Only, Only just. just. Last month, yeah. But do you feel that much older? No, I don't really feel that much older at all, mm. to tell you the truth. No, it seems to have uh, passed in the twinkling of an eye since I wrote that song, uh, which was around the time I was <clears throat> beginning to, to play music solo rather than... I've been in a band before, mm. and that was one of the first songs I wrote to play solo, so really... It doesn't seem that long ago at all. First, first song you wrote for, to, to sing solo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But in fact, the soloist who actually got the song going was mm. Kirsty McCall. That's right, yeah, well... Um, a mere woman, you might say. Mm, but, but a very talented <laughs> one, very talented one. The daughter of Ewan McCall, the folk singer, mm. and uh, someone who I'd, I'd always uh, admired as a singer when she was signed to uh, Stiff Records in, in the late 70s. And uh, I met her at a gig one day, and she said, oh, I want to record one of your songs. I said, well, you know, please help yourself. And I didn't hear nothing for a long time, as you, as you tend not to. And uh, eventually she rang me up one morning and said, uh, uh, first she said, can you write me another verse? Another two, verse, yeah, did you? Yeah. Oh, I did, yeah. So what yeah. was the verse we didn't <clears throat> hear then? Um, uh, the other verse, which I, I don't sing, Kirsty Kirsty uh, does it. Um, it was it's something about, um, uh, uh, once upon a time alone, I waited by the telephone, uh, waiting for someone to pull me through, and when at last it never rang, I knew. It wasn't you. I think Shakespeare would have been proud of it. Lovely. Yes, yes, Lovely. Yeah. There's, not yes. a, there's not a dry eye. No. But now listen, tell me this. Would mm. you have, did you write that song with Kirsty in mind, or did you write it with a person in mind? That is, a woman or a man could have sung that, do you mean? Yeah, I think so. Well, I did mm. actually, for Kirsty, also I had to change the gender, because there's lines in there about um, uh, girls I loved at school mm. already pushing pram. So I had to change the gender for Kirsty as well. So I, you know, it was hard. Did you mind, did you mind that she made such a success of it? No, not and at all. And you didn't? No, no, not at all, because... Um, I think that um, myself not being really um, particularly interested in having hit singles, I mean, that first LP that New England is on, we didn't even bother releasing a single from it. Um, and Kirsty coming along and having a hit single with it, and her husband is a very talented producer called Steve Lillywhite, who's worked with a number of uh, very big bands like U2 and Big Country. And he changed the song completely and, and made it from being a, um, well, the song you just heard, into being 
what we could call a commercial pop song. When do you say you're not interested in hit singles? Why aren't you? They make you money? Well, yes, well, they do. They, make, they, they do indeed make, uh, make considerable amounts of money, but uh, the hoops that you have to jump through to have hit singles these days are, are get more and more ridiculous what as it goes What are the hoops? On. What kind well, of hoops? Well, to start with, you have to, you have to make a video <coughs> to start with. So the budget for an average video is £50,000. Yeah. So to start with, you have to be sure that when your record comes out, it's definitely going to... Uh, generate £50,000 so you can make your money back so then you can begin making money. So if you're going to make a record that's going to compete with Culture Club, you've also probably got to spend another 50000 maybe £100,000 with the right studio and the right producer and the right ambience. Whereas, you know, and, and, then, and then you just kind of sit back and hope it, it goes like this. And of course, of, the, of the, the, the records released every week, the hundreds of records released a month, only a, a fraction get into the top four and it's usually bands who are already well known. So. Why, do you, why do you insist, you, you do don't you, on mm -hmm. the price of your records? You have the price on the, on the, on yeah. the thing and it can't be sold for, for more than the well, price Well you can try the... but if we print the price on the cover yeah. of the record it can be quite difficult. Now, why have dealers. you done that? Well um, obviously if I'm going to make a record uh, just with myself and guitar it doesn't really cost me a lot of money to make records mm. and I believe that um, if I'm going to make you know, a, a, a saving on making records that should be passed right through to the consumer. And also, I've got to compete with Duran Duran, and I can't compete on the video scale. I can't compete by spending huge amounts of money. So it's 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 more uh, true to what I do to to you know to to do it the other way and, and to to put a price on my on my song so that everybody. I mean, some of the I think a lot of the songs I do um, are listened to by people who, who don't often buy records either. Mm. So I want it, you know. For instance, when Kirsty had a hit with New England for the price of Kirsty's 12-inch single, that the large disco mix, you could buy the entire album, which had. No, yeah, but know. are you doing, you see, I mean, this is a, 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 unkind, a bit unkind mm. of me to say this, but I mean, say for instance, when a shop can't get rid of something, mm -hmm. they put a lower price on yeah. it. Now, you're not, you're not doing, you're not bribing us by having low prices. No, I'm just, you're no, not saying. I'm, no, I'm just standing back and saying that I, I, I personally feel that the, the, the record industry overprices itself mm. by encouraging the expenditure on videos, by encouraging huge expenditure on packaging and, 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 and stuff like that. It's an industry that runs on excess. Mm. I'm just someone who, who, who is determined to make records um, that are um, both uh, cheap but interesting, available, accessible. The whole mm. thing about what I do is, is trying to remain accessible and not become uh, someone who's stuck in an ivory tower somewhere. Right, so now then, your accessibility, do you think that's why you go on without much trapping? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, certainly, I, I, I'm, it's easier for me to co communicate with the audience without a band. If I, if there was a band, then it would be something that uh, would be a bit more difficult to get across. And, mm. and it's very important to me to try to attempt. It's not always possible, but to try and break down the barriers between myself and the audience at a, at a gig, at a show. Sometimes it's very easy. Other times, it's it's not so mm. easy. So. I'm not sure whether it's more confident of you though to go on in a simple jumper and mm -hmm. trousers and you know no backing. Mm -hmm. Whether that's really very conf confident, almost kind of cocky, mm. almost cocky. Well, I wouldn't say it was cocky. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's it's attempting to be the same on and off stage and not have mm. a different persona that you know that I, I I take off with the wacky clothes in the evening. I try and be myself as much on stage as off stage. Mm. I think that helps with that breaking down the barrier. Yeah. Yes. Now breaking down the barrier for you is because you think your message is what you. What you're interested well, I, yeah, in getting I do across. Think, I do think that, that obviously if people are buying Billy Bragg records, they must be buying them for the lyrics because there's not much else mm. on there. You know, there's the, mm. the, the uh, this kind of average fair to middling guitar playing and the lyrics. And I've always been someone who, when he listens to music, has always um, listened to lyricists. I mean, I like dance records as well, but I've more, you know, I've more always uh, sort of gone towards lyric writers like Elvis Costello and, and, and Smokey Robinson, people like that, you know. Mm. You write love songs as well, not just, you know, not just political songs, love you, songs I know well. you do, you write, you, you write love songs mm. all right, but yeah. they're awfully unhappy. No, I don't think they're awfully unhappy. I they're just wistful. They're, mm, they're, they are, they are um, more based in, in, in my real experiences because, I, you know, there are people who, who, who would like you to believe that love is something like Father Christmas and, and it comes to everybody and it's exactly the same to everybody and it's rockets and everything, which I think when you eventually come across it, it's, it's different to everybody and it has different, means different things to different people. So yep. I'm just getting my, my, my point of view in there alongside you know, everybody else's. I know, but at 28, most, a lot of people have, have settled for someone mm. by 28, haven't yeah. they? You haven't. No, no, well, it's all part of this um, uh, 
writing started writing poetry at school and never grew out of it phase, you know, I suppose. I, my mum still thinks I'll eventually grow out of it and get a proper job, you know, but you, <laughs> I'm sure I will. But you, your mother thinks that what you're doing isn't a proper job. No, no, I don't think she does because it, it's not proper hours and it's not, you know, I'm, I'm sure um, there's plenty of people who think that, that my job entails, you know, an hour and a half every evening, just pick up the guitar and go out and, and play and then it's all over and I don't, you know, I just sort of sit around all day watching, watching, watching the telly, telly. not doing anything, you know. <laughs> which it's, you know, some days it is, but um, a lot of the time it's, it's a continual uh, travelling, uh, arriving, uh, doing, the thing, doing sound checks, you know, getting the sound mm. right before and trying to get a meal in, uh, staying up very, very late um, and then getting up very early the next day and, and starting all over again. Travelling all the time, right? always strikes me as a way of not avoiding, but it can avoid mm. friendships. Yeah, it can. It does not very handy to make friendships no. because you're travelling around and meeting different people every day. And, and, and it's very difficult to have, a, a, you know, even just a normal, stable relationship with anybody, really. Mm. But um, there, are, there are people who, who understand in popular music that it, this is what it does to you and, 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 uh, and that they're the ones who, you, you know, you manage to, to get on with. Do you know why you got the calling? I'm going to use the calling for a moment, deliberately, mm. and then we'll go on to your political message the later. Calling, the calling to play guitar solo or the, or yes. the calling to... Well, to let's write. start there. Well, I um, became, became very, very interested in music during the, uh, the, the punk explosion in 1977. And uh, there were a number of bands then, bands like The Clash and The Jam and obviously Costello who we already m mentioned, who I thought were kind of come along and, you know, genuinely changed the world by making records and doing gigs. Which, uh, when you think about it, it's quite a naive well, way. I know, I know, well, it's I don't know, because, extremely naive yeah, well, way. Because I mean, what you know, were they singing about? They were singing about, yes, OK. You know, they're singing about some of the same sort of things that I sing about. Uh, although now, you know, I, I, I use the lessons I learnt from them and, and their um, inability to change the world, which is obviously not change the world by, you know, revolutions don't mm. start in record shops, it's, it's ridiculous. But I've learnt from those, you know, those ideas to carry on doing this. And by 1980, the, the punk thing had ended up and all that had happened was that the, the people who did dress in the wacky clothes, um, the, the, the pop idols had, had, had come back and all we seemed to have done was clear the decks and make way for Duran Duran and, and Spandau Ballet and stuff like that. So. Um, I kept waiting and waiting for some band to come along and, you know, write what I wanted to hear songs about. And eventually, I thought, well, you know, maybe, I, I you know, I should, I, if, you know, let's, let's do it myself, which was a great, you know, the great punk idea, you know, do it yourself. You'd tried other jobs, right? Yeah. Including, I don't know whether this is a, true, is it a goat herd? Mm, I was a goat herd for a Yeah, while, where yeah. were you a goat herd? Near Barking? No, no, there aren't that many goats. <laughs> the, the goat herds are not, not many goat herds in Barking anymore. <laughs> exactly. No. This, so is, I was... this was um, uh, in a place uh, called Oundle, which is near Peterborough. Ah. And uh, this, this, the whole story is there was a recording studio at this place. It was a farmhouse recording studio in the true uh, sort of... Uh, 60s, it was uh, this very 60s. Yeah, yeah, very 60s yes. tradition. And uh, it was an excuse for me and the band that I was then in, all the lads, to get away from, from our parents and all get together and stay up real late, but to actually, you know, look after the place. My job was, was looking after the goats. And also, you told me, because you've just said Oundle, didn't you? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. Was where you saw the twin satellites. The two satellites there. in New England. I actually saw them on the way back from the chip shop one night. Yeah, you know how you tend to walk around eating chips and looking at the sky like this? You know, in the sort of Patrick Moore tradition. And I saw these two satellites. You can see in the country, you can see much more stars. Much you know, To someone like mm. me who could ever see anything because of the smoke from Fords at Dagenham. It's really amazing to see that there are lots of stars. And I saw these two satellites flying. I thought, oh, isn't that sweet? And the sort of the, uh, the innate songwriter in me made me nip back around to the chip shop and get some more paper. And it's always like, you're but always making notes I know, everywhere. But, you know, I know, but did, like you, did you actually, have you written a song about the tw twin satellites yet? No. no, not about them well, specifically, we... but it's just instances in songs. You know, you might yes. get a good line from a song, you know, that fits mm. in here and there. You say that, you know, where you lived, the sky was too grey to, mm -hmm. to see the stars, right? Yeah. Do you think at all, uh, since you're, I mean, I mean, you're young enough for me mm. to ask you this question, yeah. and I'm old enough for me to ask you yeah. it, do you if blame, you say so, mate, if I'll you, take, your, <laughs> take your word for that. <laughs> do you blame your parents, that is, mm. the previous generations, for what the world is like for you today? No, I think it would be, uh, I think the previous generation had as much to do with being able to run the world as my generation does and would like mm. to. I mean, we all are victims of the circumstances uh, that, that we live in. You know, there are things I can look back on uh, the previous generation and think, you know, for setting up the welfare state and stuff like that, that I'm particularly proud of them doing. And there's other things that I'm, you know, uh, were obviously, in hindsight, great mistakes. I think my generation will, 
with all the best will in the world will make ridiculous mistakes and the generation after that will rebel against us you know our children will rebel just as well as, as we've rebelled against our parents and I think that's an ongoing thing and always will be so no I don't particularly blame the previous generation mm. for, for, for uh, the world I live in I think they're, they're as much victims of it but it sounds a bit easy to blame Mrs. Thatcher, which is what you often do. Yeah, I, I, well, it's a I bit don't, snip yeah, well, to I mean, just you know, blame you have Mrs. To remember Thatcher. that Mrs. Thatcher is running the country. Mm. So if you are looking around for someone to say, well, I wonder what, you know, why are these hospitals closing down and why are we uh, finding um, uh, so many people are, are losing hope in, in, you know, leaving school to come to absolutely nothing? It's obvious that I'm not going to stand back and say, well, you know, it, it must be to do with, with Bobby Robson, the England manager, hasn't come up with any good results. It's <laughs> obvious that we're going to look to see, well, the government that's currently right. running the country. Right, now then. So, where did you get your political, your strong mm. political feelings from? Well, I think growing up in, in, in Barking, which has always been a Labour, a Labour borough, as mm. long as, as since, since Labour was invented, yeah. has, has always put that, you know, that innateness in me and that sort of sense of, of, of fairness. But it was always, it was honed down for me in the end by by the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979. I think that was when I suddenly realised that, that politics wasn't something that didn't affect me. Mm. And a lot of the things that I'd grown up taking for granted, that free education, the, well, the welfare state in general, free health care, um, and, and, and the, the promise that when I reached retirement age, the state would, would take me as a responsibility and not just sort of like tuck me away somewhere and, and leave me. Because I think the young and the... Although I speak mostly for the young people, I think the young and the old are the most... Um, victimised at the moment by, by the circumstances. And it was realisation of that that made me want to, uh, to, 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 or actually made me aware, it didn't make me want to get involved at first, it made me aware that politics was something I should be interested in. Mm. Because in fact, you see, only 50% of first voters voted in the last general mm. election. That's right? very worrying, that. I it's a, a very, very, very apathetic. Yeah. And if you're not rebellious when you're young, this goodness knows when mm. you're going to be rebellious well, I mean, again. Quite quite so, but I would also point out that the first time I had to vote, I didn't bother voting, not because um, I wasn't interested in politics, but because I thought that no, you know, pol politics had absolutely nothing to do with me, that there was no choice anyway, that it was an unfair system and I didn't mm. want to become involved in it. Mm. Um, I, I realise now that it was something that I should have taken an interest in and that I should have been more aware of. I mean, I think I was partly um, standoffish about it from just out of that rebellious spirit that you were just talking about. Mm. You know, and, uh, it's, it's a fault with... with with the Labour Party for taking young votes for granted and, and, mm. and, and, and failing to get their ideas across. I mean, young people aren't just going to sit back and, 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 and you know, d d play, play dog for any party. They've no. got to be, you know, spoken to and listened to. Yeah, but I mean, yes, but they can't be spoken necessarily specially to. I mean, you're, you're old enough to understand mm. and make up your own minds, yeah. after all. I mean, oh, just to spoon-feed you. you. Exactly, mm, to yeah. spoon-feed you isn't right, is it? No, it's but, not. But tell me, I mean, you see... There is, I've, I've felt this, you know, it's infuriated mm. me rather, you know, mm. recently, to, to feel that young people don't think politics are worth their, yeah, worth their minds. Yeah, that infuriates right? me as well. Now, isn't it partly that if you've got, and we're excluding the very large number of unemployed people mm -hmm. there are, but if you've got a lot of people who at the moment mm -hmm. are in jobs, they're yeah. getting an awful lot of what they think they want, that mm -hmm. is in consumer yeah. goods. Yeah. Now, how can you appeal to them? Because well, they are the ones you've got to convert. Yeah, they they are, feel yeah. all right. I'm yeah. all right, Jack. Well, I've right, never yeah. had it so well, good. I've never had it so yeah, good. Obviously. Some people can say that at the moment. And, and, and quite rightly so. And, you know, and, and this is something we've got to appeal above and beyond and, and get beyond this sort of materialism that I think is at the basis of the current government's ideas. They seem to be doing everything so that they can give people tax cuts and give people their money back. But I think we're finding, really, that the only people who are benefiting are the, are the top... 5% in the City of London. You know, obviously from being a member of the Labour Party and doing a lot of sh gigs with the Labour Party and being interested in the way they formulate their ideas for young people, we've got to appeal to a collective spirit above and beyond that and think about, you know, OK, well, fair enough, you know, you might not need um, the, the social services at the bottom of your road at the moment, but what about when you're a bit older? Mm. What about your kids? What about mm. your, your mum and your granny? What are they going to do? You know. do? Do you think you felt this? You know, in other words, what you're trying to say is that you want things to be fairer, don't you? As well. Yeah, I think that's right. you know, that's what we're talking about. But where, where do you? Did you feel as if life was very unfair for you as a child? 
Yeah, I think everybody feels that, doesn't they? Everybody gets yeah. that urge of sort of like, you know, slamming doors and wanting to leave home. I don't think I, I, I mean, I did it, I'll be honest, at the time I thought it was just me in the entire world. That's mm. where music became important to me. Yeah. Because I felt that I was the only person who was having these traumas. I was the only person who, who any of this was happening to. And it was only through listening to, because nobody at school speaks about it, you know, that's the sort mm. of thing that you don't talk Why about. Why not, though? Well, because we're all very shy, aren't we? We all, we all want to be part of the group. None of us want to stand, you know, we all dread, I mean, there's, there's always people who dread their mum coming to school in case she said something out of, you know, all oh, my mum's come up to school. So that, that's something that I think you always want to be part of a group and you yeah. always want to dress with a group and everything. And the individual in you is, is sort of um, hidden away. And that's when you, 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 you come up and, and, and end up being, having your emotions a bit, a bit warped and not being able to talk to people, not being able to have relationships. It's all based, I think, from that period, um, you know, from, from uh, sort of puberty to around the time you leave school. Do you think you're talking because, more particularly because you're a boy, that in fact boys aren't allowed to be quite as sensitive it's as they want to be? Well, be this could well be because I mean, although I went to a, a, a mixed school, you know, we never had obviously very um, uh, that sort of very intimate discussions with, mm. with the girls at that school, and I, I think yeah, you probably is a bit a bit too laddish. Mm. It's something that I, I suffered from a bit, being withdrawn. You know, everybody, when I was a kid, everybody had sort of gone out and passed their driving tests and, and all that sort of stuff. And I was sort of still um, at home trying to make some significance out of, the, out of, out of anything, really. And that's why mm. I turned to playing the guitar and, and, and everything else, you know. What, to express your own feelings? Yeah, for myself. you weren't able to with your buddies? Yeah, for myself in mm. the first place. And not, for, not to, you know, not to mm. become uh, a, a sort of inverted commas a pop mm. star, but really to, to, to you know, sort of, get my formulate my things I feel as if I was doing something do you yeah. think you represent a lot of people your age do you think you are typical or are you an accurate voice for a lot of them I don't know I, I don't think that um, well you meet them don't you I do yeah I mean I meet a lot of them and some of them agree with me and some of them disagree with me yeah. which is fine yeah uh, it's much more important that when they listen to what I have to say that they can uh, go into it with an open mind that's very important to me mm. because just because I happen to say it and because I happen to be up on the stage or I happen to be on on your program and it doesn't mean that the point of view I have is necessarily 100% watertight and correct mm. it's my point of view and it's as relevant as the point of view of Frankie Goes to Hollywood or the point of view of, of whoever, Norman Tebbit. And I want people to, to listen and, and to say, OK, well, that's, that's fair enough. And it's important to me that the audiences are not, you know, too reverent, if you know what I mean, you know, just because mm. you happen to be up there on a stage. Previous, see, previous generations have looked to people like Bob Dylan and, and thought, you know, this one man on a stage is the spokesman for our generation. So I'll buy mm. me Bob Dylan LP and I won't bother doing anything about getting involved with yeah, it, you know. Yeah. Bob Dylan is our conscience and, of course, Bob, what is Bob Dylan? He's an entertainer. He's a singer. He's well, not, what are you then? That's right, I'm an entertainer. I'm a singer. I just happen to feel that as a songwriter I should reflect the society that I come from. That's all. That's the only difference between me. Well, you're a plain me. entertainer and that you pair it all down with yeah. no gimmicks, right? No. Which everybody says about you. No gimmicks. You've yeah. got no gimmicks. Well, it's, 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 it's a no gimmick, gimmick already, no by the way. It's a gimmick. It's exactly. impossible to get away from it because <laughs> people are so expecting a gimmick. You know, well, what's your gimmick? Well, I haven't got any gimmicks oh what a great gimmick that's you know, right well, exactly i know you can't win it, you, you know, can't win yeah, kid yeah, you know. but so in other words an entertainer but with a message is, would that be accurate every entertainer has a message frank sinatra has a message even if it's oh, just well they're usually course. other people's messages yes well all right, you write your own writer, even you know duran duran's message is mm. that, that that you know oh dear my yacht's capsized or whatever they have to be you know oh dear my haircut has gone lank you know <laughs> well, so yeah. it's still a message so you know, a message. the fact that my message is more uh, to do in some songs, with, with a social thing, is that's, yeah. that's what I think that's the difference. You know. Well, thanks for talking to me, because you're now going to sing us a song. Are you not? Oh, I am indeed, mate. Thank so you I very am. much. Thank you. And I, I'm going to remind you that we'll be back on Wednesday, 8 plus 4, Channel 4 at 4 o'clock, so please join us then. Until then, from me, goodbye, and from Billy Bragg, his current single, Days Like These. Party that became so powerful by sinking foreign boats is dreaming up new promises, cause promises win votes, and being resolute in conference with the ad man's expertise. The majority by their silence shall pay for days like these. The right to build communities is back behind closed doors between government and people stands the right arm of the law and shame upon the patriot when the mark of a bulldog breed 
is a family without a home and a pensioner in need. Those whose lives are ruled by dogma are waiting for a sign. The better dead than Red Brigade are listening on the line. And the liberal with a small L cries in front of the TV. And another demonstration passes on to history. It's the best we can achieve And wearing badges is not enough In days like these